are live on Facebook, man. What's going on, B? How you doing today, brother? All right, all right. Man, good to be here, man. Absolutely. Thanks for joining me in the studio, brother. Always good to be in Studio 1A. Studio 1A. Man. Studio 1A. Uh, we had a great coaching call today, man, on yeah. The Matrix. We say that every week because every week they're great. They get better and they better. They get better, I'll tell you what, man. Oh, man. Um, we got to, uh, you know, talk about your walkthrough that you did yesterday yep. on a beautiful property. Um, and, uh, you know, so before we get into that on today's podcast, we are going to talk about, you know, getting your, getting your, um, units rent ready, um, who's going to live there, attracting the right tenants. Um, so, you know, get ready for that. And, um, you know, once again, thank you guys for joining us on by the block with Brian Chavis. Um, I'm your co-host, Nathan Johnson. We got best-selling author, Brian Chavis in the house, in the house, man. Um, Brian, so, um, Tell me, I mean, what, tell me more about this walkthrough yesterday. Um, that, that property was beautiful, man. Yeah. Um, excited about this project. You know, obviously if we can, you know, we can get the price point to where, you know, it, it makes sense, but it's yeah. Highly desirable. Yep. You know, St. Pete, North St. Pete gateway corridor. Um, can't say enough. This is the entire nation, the entire world. You know, this is, this is ideally where a lot of folks want to be. Right. So, um, yeah, you know, it's just the process though. Um, how do I explain this for those? Cause sometimes it's difficult okay, to understand what's going on in here. Right. Because what's going on in here is 15 to 20 years of property management experience of managing thousands of rental units like the ones you see me walking. Right, right. So, you know, you got to remember, I managed 3,500 rental properties, different properties, okay. different communities. I understand how to put together a management plan. So I'm putting, the, I can put together a management plan in my head. So when I'm walking, all this stuff is going, that's why you always see me break off. Right. Joe will go with the broker and listen to his sales pitch. I'm not interested in the sales pitch. By that time, I've already done my Ciota. Right. Uh, so I have I have an understanding of who my prospect tenant, their demographics and psychographics are. Okay. So I need to go and see the property and walk, and and and, and begin to see, you know, experience, maybe shop them. Right. Uh, experience I have experience, obtain experience with myself and the management staff. Uh, visit the other neighboring properties, do yep. the same thing, shop them, have one on one experience with their staff, so I can see the areas of efficiency and yep. deficiency in the way they operate. And then I'm able to start putting together the management plan on how to execute. Right. I like how you go into that. I mean, you started, you pulled away from the the group, um, you know, immediately when I see the property, it's, it's, it's gorgeous. Uh, the prospectus looks beautiful and you kind of eliminate all the glitz and glamor and mm -hmm. just say, look, you know, yeah, we got to, you know, step away from the romantic kind of yeah. aspect of it. Cause it's uh, a gorgeous property. It's the hardest part of, of real estate for me for, yeah. for assets like this. I mean, right. you can go into C class and are in the hood and yeah. see some assets that, you know, you're not enamored <laughs> by, you know, you're, you're just thinking, you know, financial gain and opportunity, right, right. Um, you know, risk reward. But when you step onto a property like this, this is where a lot of uh, beginning investors get, can get themselves in trouble because yeah, they're enamored by what they see. Right. Because they would love, they would live there. They would recommend their friends and family to live there. So you're enamored by just the overall um, pristine conditions, you know, of this rental property. Um, and you start seeing opportunity. Right. You know. Um, but you don't rely on your CO to information. Okay. And as I told everyone in the, in the, in the, in the coaching program today, that's where you get in trouble. When you, mm. I don't make decisions. Based on an offering memorandum, pristine package, good looking pictures, right. step foot on the property, and then sh shockly and being shocked by heck, the pictures didn't do the property justice in my <laughs> right, opinion. Right, right. I thought the, the the property itself was 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 just you know I th it, was, it was beautiful. Yep. But that can get you in trouble. So Absolutely. understanding the lot to allow the CEO to strategic evaluation of the target area, the information that you're extracting from your due diligence on the target area, let it speak for you. Right. Yay or nay, whether or not this is a good project for you and your group, you know, it's going to always keep you out of trouble because emotionally, you know, I would love to do this project. Right. 
emotionally, if I, if I, if I, if I acted on emotion, you know, I would have uh, done a thousand deals by now and I would have done probably 999 wrong. Right. Right. So yeah, you gotta, you know, the, the learning lesson is, you know, you gotta rely on the fundamentals and rely on the strategic evaluation of the target area, the due diligence that you're doing on the subject property in the market. And that's far before you ever even start really evaluating properties. You've, you're doing this homework right. in advance in areas that you're considering targeting. This is the homework. So by the time you find a property like this, mm -hmm. you already have an avatar of who the prospect tenant is, mm -hmm. the demographics, who they are, the psychographics, the why they choose certain things. So when you step foot on this property, that's why you see my wheels spinning and, and you know me go off in my separate way because right. I'm developing that management plan in my head on what I can do okay. to improve and value add on that particular project. And then that's that's how because I, I already have an understanding of who that prospect tenant is because of the, the CODA process. Mm. This is chess, not checkers. Right, exactly. And so, yeah, that's part of um, deciding who's going to live there. You're taking a look at the I have an yeah. avatar. Right. I know who that pretty much know exactly who they are. Right. I know that that tennis court wasn't good for them. Right. That that needed to be cut off and made into some sort of half court, maybe, you know, half court basketball right. that, you know, I, I, just certain things that you see, you know, other than that, I really didn't see any, any major issues, but, you know, just understanding, you know, cosmetically and, and various different things, amenity wise that, you know, the way the models were set up, I personally would do the models differently because right. there wasn't enough emphasis in the models on work home, okay. work from home type of setup. Right. Knowing that those millennials, most millennials, even if they have an office job, most now work from home. So being able to show, and even those who don't work from home do a lot of work at home uh, for the office. So being able to have the models and in 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 showing the models in such a way that, uh, you know, that allowed them to show them that they can have a live and workspace mm -hmm. environment to work from home. You know, it's just really understanding who your prospect is. So when they walk those units, and they visit the model, you've anticipated their needs in advance. You already know. It's like Walmart, Publix, or any good super supermarket chain understands how to stock the shelves right. according to the demographics and psychographics of their prospect client, right. shopper, prospect shopper. And that changes from zip code to zip code. You might go into Walmart in one zip code and see something on the shelves totally different. Because each zip code speaks differently right. to that particular shopper, their demographic and their psychographic. So you can go into a neighborhood in one zip code and see things on the shelves in the store set up somewhat differently right. than a, another store in another zip code area. Because, again, it's about speaking to the particular demographic and psychographics of that shopper. And you have yeah. to do the same thing and apply the same type of knowledge and know-how into uh, the multifamily industry, but a lot of people don't talk about that, Nate. Correct. Because what we get involved in with social media and all this and books yep. is only one phase, the acquisition phase, right. evaluating and underwriting deals as if that's the only thing involved with operating multifamily. Right. And then the, the objective then becomes, well, now when it comes to operate and talk about this stuff that we're talking about, Oh, you just give that to a property management company. Right, right. But there's no guarantee. It's safe to say 90% of property management companies out there are not running at an institutional level. Right. They don't have the knowledge and know-how, you know, especially in, in the multifamily space. You know, they might be good at renting homes and things of that nature, but in mm -hmm. the multifamily space, it really, it really takes an institutional type of mindset, mm -hmm. someone to have that type of experience, really, in my opinion, to, 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 to have that know-how to run things operational. So operationally. Um, so it's very important to be able to right. then get outside and, and start focusing on what I was when I was doing that walkthrough, the implementation phase, which is setting up the operating systems for that property based upon the management plan that was set forth. Right. Or I, that, I, that I'm setting forth, you know, well before due diligence. Right. So, you know what I mean? And then that leads into stabilization, stabilizing the asset Implementing the value add plan, right? Stabilization it leads to growth, growth leads to exit strategy, and that's how they all intertwine. Well, you know, and that's I mean that's why I love you know one of the benefits of having you in the studio is that we get to just dive deeper into your book and into your knowledge. Um, in in buy it rent it profit, um, it's part three. It's landlording essentials. So there's chapter eight 
who will live here. Um, and there's a section that's called readying for rent. Um, you know, as you're saying, you know, you, you're not just going to hand this off to a third party property management. There's all these questions that you're well, starting. Let's, yeah. well, let's say not to interrupt. You may. You may. Yeah. I'm saying if you do hand it off to a third party property manager, you just don't hand the property off. You hand the property off with the management plan right. in place saying this is how you want the property run. Right. Not just handing the property off to somebody, even though they might be in the market. Right. It doesn't matter. Each property has its own brand. Right. So I have to guarantee as a syndicator, as a general partner, I have a pref, a return yep. that I'm guaranteeing. And I know my management plan puts me in the best position like a head coach. Right. I know my playbook puts me in the best position and my players in the best position to win. Right. So I'm not just going to hand my team off, hand my team off as a general manager to a coach without, even though that coach might coach some other teams in that area. Correct. I'm not going to hand my, my team off to this particular coach because my particular team has to operate under my particular brand. Right. right. And that is done through a, a management plan uh, and that management plan then is handed off to the to the to the and, and to the to the third party property manager if that's what you choose to do. But right. But you're dictating what what how it operates. Right. Well, I'd like to ask you a few questions based on these are questions that are listed in the book. And I want you to kind of go into more detail. So these are questions that you're kind of going into as you're um, you know conducting your market survey. Um, you know, once again, before we hand this off to a property, a third party property manager, Either you should be going over these questions with them or knowing these. Um, what are you charging for the rent? You know, why is that a question that you're you're asking when you're starting to get ready to rent out these properties? I know it sounds trivial, but you know, I want I would love to hear your thoughts on you know. Yeah, it's so not so trivial you know, when you know it impacts yeah, that, what that will you net charge operating for income, right? Why, why is that? A, why is that a question you have to think about? Uh, you know, you're asking yourself what you're going to charge for rent. Uh, you're compiling your rent schedules at the time. So just understanding where you're going to come at price point, you're going to come at based upon the way the property looks yep. and the condition that it's in when you take over. Um, it's just really understanding where you, where are you going to enter the market? For example, I didn't enter the market in downtown St. Pete with $999 rents. Right. I entered the market maybe what? 10, $15 above the weighted average of only eight, 25850 Right, okay. I didn't jump in there and, and, and automatically increase the rents. You know, I, I went through a, one or two cycles of renewals um, to better understand the prospect tenant. Even though I have my avatar of who they were, I honed in on who they were, and then I, I started modeling the units and understanding who they were by asking questions, and then we, we gradually started increasing rent. So just understanding what your starting point, where your starting point is, and understanding the expectations of your property. Um you know, is, is, you know, because uh, what you want to charge in rent and what you can is two different things. That's a great question. <laughs> or that's a great answer. And and then so another question you have here is what is your application fee? So why is that an important part of? Well, you know, this is, you know, the, and the most of this is, is, is very trivial, very, you know, as, as you said, but it, it's important to look at what the barrier of entry is for access to your particular rental unit. Right. So you're looking at what it, what it really the question is is what are the others charging in the area right for your, for for fees because when I first got there uh, in downtown St. Pete I noticed an overwhelming trend which is people are charging an application fee but then they're also charging an admin fee for wow. another twenty yeah another twenty five dollar admin fee so it's the fifty dollar application fee from which really only costs fifteen dollars right so they're probably paying let's just use Buildium for example right, so if right. you're running Buildium and you're screening through Buildium. They charge you fifteen to twenty dollars for a premium screen. Okay. You're charging the applicant maybe fifteen fifty to seventy five dollars. Right. So you are automatically benefiting from the markup. But then I found, you know, you're also in the area in this particular market. Individuals at the Class A properties were also charged another an additional twenty five dollar admin fee. So you're making a couple of hundred dollars, you know, with every screen. And you know, at the end of the day, that I mean, that's 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 uh, that's a decent amount of income for either the property itself or the management company that's the main that manages the property, or maybe a, a revenue share right, right. between the ownership and the management company. But either way, that's uh, what we call other income on a property. That's additional income that uh, you know that you know that you know that's that's a parking space. I charge right. thirty five dollars for a parking space. Right. 
I make I make more money on the screen than I do the parking spaces. Is is that something that um a property management company could kind of hide from an investor, like, or do they have the right? I mean, so that's a good question. Once again, you're passing yes. this off, and you're not paying attention. And yes, you yes, know. yes. That's revenue that. But in the management plan, it should spell out exactly where they get their fees. Right. So, like, whether or not do they charge you for renewals or lease up fees? Right. You know, all that should come in when they when you when they when they are, are, are vying for your business. They should send you over a management right. plan. Or I'm sorry, not a management plan. A uh, 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 a contract, right. a management agreement, and in there it should have their fees and what they take. Um, right. And typically, screening is a management fee. Right. Uh, the property management company usually takes a hundred percent, or there's a revenue share. Got it. Um, I like the I like the ref share. Yeah. Uh, you know, like I said, because it's adding value to the uh to the property and adding income to the property. And again, with a twenty five dollar admin plus fifty dollar application fee, and you're only getting charged by the by the TransUnion or the building right. or the app folio, fifteen to twenty five dollars. Your markups are there's enough revenue to share with the owner. Right, exactly. And and the reason that's why I asked you is that you know we're looking at value adds and you know other ways to make income within the property. And uh, once again, if you're just passing this off, you you're missing out on you know especially when you have several units. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's good oh yeah. Money. When you get into that, you yeah, know, hundreds of units, eighty, fifty, yeah, you know even forty units, you're screening multiple people. Yeah. A week. So, yeah, that's that's good income. Exactly. And, um, you know, and I apologize, B, if these are trivial questions, but this is, you know, we got our our listeners. uh, Some of these people don't even own their first property. So I want to, you know, just help people understand the vastness, you know, of and then how how we think about this. It's it's more than just. It's not trivial. These are these these are what it's called fundamentals. Yeah, because I mean, I'm telling you, you got to grasp the fundamentals. And when you when they put those prospectus in front of your face and you see it, I mean, the, the little shiny investments um you know you have to really just kind of put the you know emotions aside and, mm-hmm. and go through these questions mm-hmm. um so security deposit why is that something that you start looking at in the very beginning like as you're starting to operate the property um why are we looking at security deposits and yes you know you you really want to be able to you know and a lot of people just look at a security deposit and look at what their competitors are charging mm-hmm. and and that's a good starting point okay. to kind of get an idea. But, you know, I'm not, you know, for me, setting the security deposit takes probably a little time. Okay. Maybe the first year I really hone in. Or not first year, first six weeks. Right. To a nine months, I really hone in because you might see some turnover. You might see some, some wear and tear after a renewal right. or someone moves out. So one or two lease terms, you get to see the wear and tear on a property. And okay. so... um you just want to set an adequate enough, uh, for example, Park Plaza. You're dealing with young professionals. Mm-hmm. But I also then noticed an element that I didn't bank on. I knew the student. I knew the young professionals. Right. But then there was this third element was the service industry. Okay. No knock against the service industry, but most of my service folks are not the most, you know, just trend-wise, yep. horrible credit. But make a ton of money. Correct. You know, they walk around with three, four thousand dollars in tip fees and whatever, you know, especially mm-hmm. downtown St. Pete. And I'm telling you what I know, not what I heard. This right, is right. prospects coming in and dropping thousands of dollars. Hey, what do I need to move in? You know, my credit score is horrible, but I'll pay an extra deposit. I'm like, Yeah, well, it'll be an extra, you know, at this time, you know, eight hundred dollars was the deposit. Oh yeah, here's sixteen hundred dollars. You know right, what I mean? Right. For either pocket. So great. You know, it it, it, it it circumvents the lack of credit. Then I focus on how long they've been on the job, qualifying criteria, so on and so forth. Okay. Okay, they pass. But what I've noticed is a trend is that they also are more apt to just walk and break a lease and leave. Wow, okay. Not even break the lease properly. Just like. Just a dip. Gone. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, it's like. You know, a couple of tenants, you know, and they're all from the service industry, bartenders. Right, right. You know, no no knock against my bartenders out there, so don't send me a private message saying, all oh, bartenders, <laughs> now I get that. I'm just talking about trends that I see and why I then set the security deposits a little differently. Right. So based upon what industry you're in, I might set a certain standards or, 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 or based upon the trends that I have. So I might raise the security deposits a little higher, you know, um, to circumvent uh, the possible turnover with a certain uh, demographic in that area. Uh, and, you know, that could be to, to, uh, to what, you know, various different factors. 
uh, the turnover issues, um, the ability, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, um, you know, if it's in a, uh, you know, a more transient type of neighborhood, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you have to, you know, and that's right. a, and when you're dealing with the transient neighborhoods, that's, that's a, that's a, that's a balancing act always right. because you, most folks can't afford. So if you say, Hey, listen, you're in a C class neighborhood and your, your security deposit is $400 and you hit them with another $400 because of their credit. Right. I mean, you're going to lose prospects. So, you know, that is, it's always a constant balancing act, but that's what you're really trying to strike right. a chord is set the security deposit to make sure you're covering some of the uh ohs that you're going to possibly run into with that particular prospect, uh, there, you know, uh, that demographic. So it's just understanding those trends. But, um, I mean, that leads me into my next question. So, what about, um, first and last month's rent? Um, how does that, I mean, it's not necessarily the same as the security no, deposit it, or whatever. No, it's, it's, it again, it, it depends on the credit okay. background check. So, the, the main thing here, let's just hone in on qualifying criteria, right. So your qualifying criteria is different for each property. Okay. No matter where it's located, it's different for each and every property, Nate. Right. So we have qualifying criteria in the book. Yep. If you turn back there in the index, you'll yep. see the qualifying criteria. That's my qualifying criteria. It, it kind of changes. 85% of it stays the same, and then the other percentage of it changes according to the demographics and psychographics of, of my prospect tenant, depending on the location of the property. Yep. So it really boils down to the qualifying criteria. Once we run you through that, what your credit, criminal, job verification, employment, once we run that, then we determine, you know, whether or not first, last, you know, or, or, or something a little higher than that based on the qualifying criteria. And I'll tell you, man, just, you know, that qualifying criteria is something serious. Absolutely. I personally got away from it. Okay, just a personal story. I got away from the qualifying criteria a couple of weeks ago. Um, no, a couple of months ago. I'm about four months ago. I got away from the qualifying criteria. And um, I moved in a young lady who had a ton of money, just pulling mm -hmm. it. Good job. Questionable credit, okay? Um, young, you know, young professional, kind of who we attract. So yeah, it's like, absolutely. okay. Your credit is, you know, but yeah. you got a good job. You're willing to pay the extra deposit. Right. Moved in. That didn't work out. That that individual ended up, that was the, the person that ended up uh, overdosing and and uh, and passing away. Mm. Had a good job. Bought in a friend, recommended a friend. This friend definitely didn't pass the qualifying <laughs> criteria, right? Right. But because it was on a recommendation of this young lady and she had a good job, she's on a job, she was steady. Right, she recommends her. I ignore my own qualifying criteria. Okay, you know, because I can make that decision, make the decision to ignore the qualifying criteria, move in this particular tenant. Worst decision I ever made. I mean, I've had to send every notice in the book, seven day notice. Had vehicle had to get towed because they were parking in parking spots right. they shouldn't be in. Uh, heavy smoker leaving cigarette butts all over the common area. Just. So many issues with that particular tenant, all because all could have been circumvented had I listened to my qualifying criteria. Sometimes it's better to sit on a vacant unit, mm -hmm. rely on your qualifying criteria to set the standards from which your tenants are screened. As long as that qualifying criteria falls in the guidelines of the fair housing law, you're following under race, color, religion, sex, national right, origin, right. familiar status, and persons with disability, and whatever amended and added classes in that that, that particular municipality adheres to okay as long as you it, it, your qualifying criteria falls in line with with the fair housing law um stick to it let it almost like the seota process let it dictate you know um what tenants you let in and let out because sometimes it's better to sit on a vacant unit you know king solomon said an empty stable stays clean but there's no income in an empty stable this is true but sometimes you know you sometimes it's, it's better to hold off and have that empty stable wait for the right horse because, um, you know, the issues that I've been having with that particular tenant and putting on the, the stress that it's put on the management team, uh, you know what I mean, far outweighs that unit had sitting vacant for an extra, even an extra week or so. I've lost more mm. on just dealing with the stress and, 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 and with that particular tenant, um, you know, so that's putting a lot of stress, undue stress on the management team. And, uh, you know, that may not show up in the P&L, 
but um, but it has a financial burden on a, on a on a team. And if you have enough of those individuals on your property, it will show up in the P and L in the in the in the in the realm of delinquencies and turnover and 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 wear and tear on common areas and and uh you know it will eventually show up you may not the naked eye may not catch it but a trained asset manager property manager a trained property manager and asset manager will catch it man yeah no thank you for breaking that down so um yeah thank you for sharing that story before we get into the next few questions b um, i want to just take a moment to um, thank our sponsors uh, this podcast is brought to you by Buy It, Rent It, Profit. It's a best-selling. Bo- it's the best-selling book for property management. It's one of the only books on property management and asset management in the U.S. Library of Congress. You can find it at your local bookstore. You can check it out on Amazon. And um, you know, once again, thank you very much for sponsoring this podcast. This podcast is also brought to you by the Multifamily Matrix. Multifamily Matrix is our award-winning coaching program where we actually provide you with weekly group coaching, all the support and systems that you need to acquire properties and to work with investors and to grow your own portfolio. So we'd like to invite you to join us at uh, brianchavis.com forward slash matrix. Once again, that's brianchavis.com forward slash matrix. And, um, you know, please subscribe to our podcast. Um, If you like the information that we're giving, um, you know, we're always thankful for uh, once again, all of our supporters. And, um, you know, once again, you know, thank you so much. So, B, uh, I have another question here as far as like the criteria when you're looking at getting a property rent ready, um, credit scores. So why are we looking at credit scores or are there some, and there's some situations where we actually could go for lower scores. Why is credit score a factor in, um, kind of evaluating or getting a property rent ready? Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, a a KPI, you know, it's, it's not the decide all correct it's just an indicator to help you understand who that tenants tendencies are right. you know as far as paying your rent on time so you're looking at a credit score and what does a credit score do in fact judges whether or not you're paying your bills on mm-hmm. time and in a timely manner so if there is a if you're a habitual late payer right that's going to show up in the credit score i.e with a lower credit score that's going to mean you know they this person doesn't pay their bills on time well if there's a trend there you're habitual in that in your payment history then there's a strong possibility that that individual will be uh, a habitual late payer on their rent. Mm. And so, you know, then you know, the different measures are certain measures have to be uh, enacted to then compensate for that. And that might be, of course, higher security deposit, um, deposit equal to rent, right? so on and so forth. And, and I'm asking these questions because, you know, as a beginning investor, some people, I hear a lot of people, they have these aspirational ideas. Oh, I want to buy um, a multifamily property and um, rent it out for sober living or uh, for the homeless or whatever. And I'm like, you know, hey, let's get a little more experience first, you know, oh, yeah, and, and yeah, it's yeah, all, yeah, we, it's yeah, all commendable. Yeah. And then beginning investors, you might be buying a single family home. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's that nice landlord. I want to be nice. I want to just give, you know, this person looks nice. I want to give them an opportunity to have a home next year. Yeah, we've home's all been there. Torn up. Yeah. We've all been there and people, cause the one thing, in this business, people will mistake your kindness for a weakness. Right. So this is a business. I, I just told you that, gave you an example of me getting away from my qualifying criteria. Look what happened. So it's a business. And when you get away and you deviate from it, it will bite you in your behind, mm. no matter how skilled, skillful you are, you know. Literally, I wrote the book on it. Absolutely. And, and seeing what happened to me. And I would say, so, yeah, and if you're trying to set up something for that, then, yeah, you scrutinize your criteria and then stick to it. You know, you can get lax on certain things, you know, okay. Yeah. You, you have, never yeah. get lax on your qualifying criteria. Correct. Once you set it, once yeah. you set it yeah. and it's a- according, like I said, to uh, your prospect tenants demographic, um, you know, cause you can only set criteria based upon, you know, you can't say three months equal to, you know, three, you must make three times the rent in, right. in certain C class properties. You, you're not going to have any tenants. So, you know, you got to set the qualifying criteria again. Like I said, you take the template, mm-hmm. what you see in the book, and, you know, and you 80 percent of it, you apply and let's say 20 percent right. of it is you adjust according to the, the demographics and psychographics and the property location. Right. So and, and so there's another one. This this is probably a, a not not it's not really a gray area. What type of criminal records will you accept? 
And then there's certain well, areas. There's certain areas ooh, where if you're in California now, this yeah. is this is this is a touchy subject because now you cannot discriminate in certain counties, right? Because they have a criminal background, which is just ludicrous. And tell so. me, I mean, outside of California or even within California, why is the criminal record something that you look at? And well, I can at? give you a ton. Of, I can give you some real life examples. I'd love it. Yeah, how please. about I give you some real life examples? Yeah, so man. you have a tenant who has a criminal background. This is why I make sure that even you know, let's say you 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 have a tenant and they want to move in their boyfriend. Mm-hmm. That's why I make sure that hey, listen, if we feel like there's somebody that's been coming by your property every day, every week, you know, they got their toothbrush at the house. We're we're approaching that that tenant saying, hey, listen, we notice this guy is here a lot. He needs to get on the lease. You know, you need to add him in. If he's there for more than seven consecutive days, mm-hmm. you know what I mean. He he's not a guest anymore. You know, he's staying there, so he right. needs to get on the lease. The reason why is because. We don't want any issues happening. Um, you know, we want to be able to screen that individual because, you know, if we find that there's a criminal background, you know, they're not going to be accepted. No. If you're accepting someone with a criminal background, and I get it, criminal reform, I understand mm-hmm. to a certain extent what California was trying to do. But mm-hmm. here's what California doesn't understand as an owner is that, and you'll see insurance companies, you'll see more about this topic with insurance as it pertains to insurance. So you have a tenant who, let's say, you move in. The risk with that tenant not doing a criminal background check, if you waive that and forget mm-hmm. that you just moved that tenant in and they have a criminal background. Mm-hmm. And let's say they get into an argument over a par- parking spot mm-hmm. on your property. Mm-hmm. Two individuals, butt heads, two neighbors. The one with the criminal background beats the heck out of the neighbor, mm-hmm. right, puts them in the hospital, injures them. You can bet that that individual will end up suing not only the person who beat them, but also the property owner as well. Right. Why? Because you moved them in. Mm. And, you know, at the end of the day, you're Morgan and Morgans, which is a huge law firm out here in, in Florida. But, you know, you're going to have the attorney, you know, most of them call them, you know, ambulance chasers or whatever, but right, you're going right. to have those guys that are come in that are going to come after the actual property owner because Correct. they have the biggest insurance policy. And unfortunately you didn't properly screen. So they're going to hold you liable and it, and, and, and it will hold up. Right. So, you know, with California, that's, that's why, you know, for me, there's, there's a, there's a to be continued because <laughs> they haven't had that issue yet. And it will Correct. happen. There's yeah. going to be someone who has a felony for physical assault. Mm-hmm. Right. And they did their time, but they have a history now. Right. Right. Okay. No matter what you have a history. That's why, you know, I always try to pre, Hey, listen, you know, think about the long-term ramifications Mm -hmm. before you do something, but that's a whole different podcast and conversation. My point here is now you have a history. So now, yes, you reformed and you went through and you done all paid your debt to society, but now you move in. Okay. You come home, boss man is stressing you. Right. You work 17 hours, right, in one day. You're stressed. Your paycheck is short. You didn't get the hours on the job. This is the, the former criminal. He's upset. He's just steaming. Boss mm. man also just cut the hours back again. Mm. Comes home. Someone's in his parking space. He goes, knocks on the door, doing his parking space. He's already steaming now because of the job. Right. They get into an altercation. Something happens. The neighbor gets beat up, gets severely injured, like I said. Right. What do you think is going to happen now? The insurance company. Now that someone's going to sue you because, hey, listen, you moved this person in. They have a criminal. Forget about the law. What, what ramifications are going to happen when, you know, uh, you know how, is, how is the insurance company going to underwrite this? Even moving forward, let's just say forget that scenario too. Now moving right. forward with the insurance companies knowing this could happen. This tendency can happen, which is a strong possibility. Now actually what happens to premiums? Because now you have to move in individuals with a tendency right. or a proven history of a certain criminal background, but you have to move these individuals in. What happens to that property's risk profile? Right. And the insurance company can care less about, you know, whether or not this is a topic of re- rehabilitation, a topic of, you know, someone finding God and, and changing the new. Mm-hmm. I get all that. And I 100 percent support that. I'm just talking facts here. Correct. Okay, I'm talking bottom line. I'm talking 
bottom line. Right. I'm talking, you know, a yeah. business. Yeah. Insurance company can care less about you found Jesus in jail or you've turned a new leaf. They look at tendencies. Correct. They can care less that we ain't had a hurricane in five years <laughs> hit Tampa. Right. They look at what? Well, you had one in certain. Yep. And then and, and they don't care. They look at tendencies. That's their job is to underwrite risk. Correct. So if you got a person that has a criminal background, there is some risk. So if they can underwrite and pull out of areas because of hurricanes or certain storms that we haven't had in years. Right. What you think is going to happen when it comes down to the criminal? So I digress. Yeah, no. But I, I just I, wanted to. I love you know, it, man, because, uh, you know, I, I'm saying these questions may be trivial, but I'm asking them. No, they're not. They're not. This is a podcast for everyone. You might be a first time investor. You might be a seasoned investor. Um, you know, but yeah, you know, philanthropy can be, for, you know, in, used in other ways, you know, um, you know, stick to your qualifying criteria and, you know, you don't want and, to find yourself. And even our seasoned guys. Yeah. Most of them are not operators right. by, by nature. Right. A lot of the seasoned guys used to flip houses and now they own multifamily because they have the ability now to raise money. Mm. Okay. Because you raise money or have the ability to syndicate or become a general partner and raise money doesn't necessarily mean you fully understand multifamily. You have the ability and the knowledge and know how to possibly evaluate markets, right. underwrite a deal, okay? Yep. Get it under contract. But then you turn it over to a property management company right. that runs it day to day. It doesn't necessarily make you a sophisticated investor. No. It doesn't necessarily, it just makes you someone who's investing in an asset class. Correct. I might invest in a restaurant one day. I've never cooked a ham. You know, I may not right. know anything about cooking. Right. So it doesn't necessarily mean I'm a, a, a master at, at understanding the restaurant business. And that's where you have to really understand that. If you get involved with multifamily, you don't have to do what I'm saying. You don't have to understand the business. Right, right. But if you're raising money, you should understand every right. aspect of this business. If right. I invest in a restaurant, I'm going to know how to cook everything on that right. damn menu. Right. I can promise you that. Whether right. it's, I don't care what it is, I'm going to know how to cook it because if all hell breaks loose, I can show up. If it, hell breaks loose on Monday, come Tuesday morning, I will show up with an apron right. and my tools and my YouTube videos, and I'll try to figure out how to cook that filet or whatever it is <laughs> that, that needs to be done according to that menu because at the end of the day, that's my, I raised the money. That's my restaurant. Correct. That's how you look at multifamily. You, just because you know how to raise money, you've put together an offering memorandum, you got some underwriting spreadsheet, that doesn't necessarily mean you're a great, might be a great syndicator, you know how to raise money, mm -hmm. but that doesn't necessarily mean that you understand all five phases of this industry. And really to navigate it, to work in the multifamily industry like I did for right, over right. two decades, you have to master all five phases to really be efficient. Uh, and know every aspect and every level to understand how to weather certain mm -hmm. cycles. We haven't really had any major, you know, cyclical issues, any mm -hmm. headwinds. Mm -hmm. None, a lot of folks haven't been tested yet, but you're going to see when, when, when those headwinds, you're going to see those who really understand this industry versus those who rely on, you know, third-party knowledge to be able to get that particular horse out of the stable. Absolutely. Um, I've got a couple more questions for you, man. But uh, before we get into these questions, um, I just want to make sure to invite you guys once again to brianchavis.com. It's just a it's a great resource where you can, you know, end up just linking up with Brian, learning more about upcoming events, getting involved in coaching and training and development. Um, as you can see, we're really passionate about helping people to acquire wealth and knowledge. Uh, so go ahead and visit brianchavis.com and sign up, uh, you know, for our email newsletters. Um, but let me get into these last couple of questions. So these, these are my, my trivial questions be, um, nothing trivial pets. Yes. Are we allowing pets? If so, what kind, and are we charging pet fees? Why is this something that we're looking at when we're getting units ready for rent? When we're about kind of putting together our, well, yeah, cause you know, with pets, you have to associate a certain amount of damage. Okay. And then nowadays you also have to associate that situation with pets with um, um, individuals having service dogs. Mm. So, you know, if they have the proper documentation, which really anyone can pull off the internet right, nowadays, right. 
um, you have to allow the pen, you know, the animal in. Um, you know, that's for another conversation Absolutely. about Absolutely. what type of pets, boa constrictors and things of that nature. I'm going to be honest with you. You can sue me. I'll take the lawsuit <laughs> on the chin. I'll tie you up in court, but you're not bringing a boa constrictor or a pit bull, or Rottweiler, or some aggressive animal breed right. onto my property. Um, it's just not going to happen. You're not endangering the rest of my tenants. Absolutely. I don't care if it's one of those Westminster or whatever it is, show dogs. If it's an aggressive breed, I'm not having an alligator. I'm not having a uh, Rottweiler. I'm not having a, you know, uh, and I've got nothing against these animals, yeah, yeah. but you got to understand this is a business. It is. Therefore, there's other tenants. And again, I know the tendencies of animals. So, you know, we all seen when animals attack. Right. That's all I need is one time for that animal to attack. Guess who gets in trouble? Yeah. You, you know, get yep. the property owner. Yep. So at the end of the day, you know, I've just been doing this long enough to know. You know I'd rather see me in court. Yeah. But a lot of your insurance companies are saying, hey, look, we won't uh, insure under aggressive breach. So, uh, again, I'd rather see you in court. But, you know, that's just my personal opinion. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying that this is law. Yeah, exactly. But I'm saying... You know, there's there's certain in my qualifying criteria. We're not taking aggressive breeds. I don't care if it's a service animal. I'll see you in court. Um, not everybody can do that. You know, if you have to take the animal, if there's a big deal about it, you don't have money to tie them up in court or, or to even take them to court. Uh, I understand that and I get that. You take the, the you know, you, yeah. If they have the proper paperwork, that's fine. You know, we we're advocating following the law. Just be clear here. Um, but I also, again, know the tendencies of cats mm -hmm. and dogs and, you know, what they can do. You know, I'm more concerned about cats than I am any kind of right, right. aggressive breed animal as far as the damage to my units. Because mm -hmm. when they spray, it's hard to even get out of carpet and tile and in the walls. Right. If it gets into the drywall, that's, 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 it's tough. Right. So um, you just understand how to set your, 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 your fees. Or a lot of people like to charge a, a pet deposit. And some people even have in their literature a non-refundable pet fee or non-refundable security deposit. Right. That's an oxymoron. There's no such thing as a non-refundable uh, deposit. <laughs> the word deposit implies that they get it back if they follow your rules and regulations. Right, right. Um, so with that being said, I go with a straight fee. Okay. So when you have a pet, cats are 350 because of, you know, yep. spayed and, you know, what they're spraying and they're a lot more difficult to, yep. to, to clean up after. Pets are, uh, dogs are, are 250 a pet. And it's a pet fee, one-time fee. Some people charge pet pet rent. That's fine, you know. But at the end of the day, it's something to be able to cover your costs when the tenant moves out, and you're like, "Oh man, what is that smell? We can't get rid of that smell." Right. Yeah, you know. Yeah, you should have had a pet fee or a pet um, adequate pet deposit or some sort um, to be able to cover that. I love it, man. Man, thank you for breaking all this down. I got one more question for you. So, um, and listeners, these questions, you know. We should be asking these when we when we start to acquire our properties and we're going to you know go out there on day one and start managing them. You're going to want to have these questions answered because these are the things that are going to help you to. Well, you let, let me yeah. jump in there. This comes in the process of. So when you're value, when you're evaluating a market mm -hmm. and you're looking for your opportunity and you've identified Austin, Texas, Tampa, Florida, St. Mm -hmm. Petersburg, Florida, the Carolinas, when you've identified the area you want to be in you begin to then start developing your management plan right. and to start developing your qualifying criteria. You don't want to necessarily lean on the property management company that you may hire. This is when you start developing this criteria right. to, to be able to your systems to operate this property. And then you, if you do third party management, you say, this is what I, how I want it operated. Right. This is how I want, you know, so you should be thinking about this as your, it goes hand in hand as you're evaluating certain markets. Because, Absolutely. you know, as you get in that market, again, you'll, begin to do your CODA strategic evaluation of a target area. And then from there, you'll have an avatar, what your prospect tenant looks like. They're uh, wise and they're, uh, you know, who they are and they're wise and why not. And then from there, that's when you begin to start developing this qualifying criteria. Absolutely. I think uh, one of the saddest things I've seen, you know, a couple of my classmates uh, putting up their uh, rental properties <clears throat> for sale because they just couldn't manage them. You know, they've done such a great thing by acquiring these properties and now they're just over their heads, you know, and, and so, words, yeah, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. And, um, if you find yourself one, you know, small plug, if you're an accidental landlord and you want to get rid of your property, uh, visit brianchavis.com, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we'd love to help you with that, but, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's just, it's really rough, you know, so these are the types of questions you should be starting to develop so that you're not going to find yourself in that type of troublesome situation. Um, 
final question, are you paying the utilities or is that going to the tenant? Is that, are you passing it on to the tenant, um, to the tenant? Um, I guess that can go either way. Why would you choose like one rubs, or the other? Right. Um, yeah, you know, that's, that's a, that's a business. A lot of individuals, you know, will look at what they call rubs. Okay. It's a ratio utility billing system. Mm. So, um, you see rubs, um, you know, and the, and the cost of water and sewage or other utilities are spread across, you know, uh, all tenants. Right. Always a good opportunity. Always a good, to me, it's always a plus to do that. Um, but, uh, yeah, you, you, you're looking at that and, you know, also the market, like right now, whew, it's tough because downtown St. Pete, there's a few people that are like, oh, you know, we have offer furnish for your rent. We pay your water, sewage, electricity, and the wow. units furnished. I'm like, yeah, we'll go there. <laughs> That's why I tell you, know, yeah, I ain't go there. Right. But, you know, right now we pay water and sewage just because of the competitiveness. But eventually I may move to a rub system mm-hmm. um, at Park Plaza uh, and spread the cost of my utilities across all tenants, uh, you know, have them pay rent. If they want a parking space, but then an extra twenty five dollars right. for uh, water and sewage. But right now it's tough because the market. Everybody is juxting for for you know a lot, a lot of new inventory. People have uh, uh, rehabbed their units. So there's a lot of competition in downtown St. Pete, even for my asset class right now. So I'm you know I'm, I'm you know I don't want to you don't want to hit everybody over the head eventually. And that may not be something that I do. That may be something for the property when we sell it. That may be something for the next that I use as a value add play for the right. next owner to increase income uh, on the property. So, you know, we'll see. Man, you know, thank you so much for breaking all this down. So um, this all ties into that Seattle process and, and you talk about demographics and psychographics. And so as you guys can see, you know, we're really evaluating the the person um, and, and the asset and how we're going to manage that. Um Man, B, thank you so much for joining us in the studio, man. Absolutely. Always, always a pleasure to get your your knowledge um, as we're growing our rental portfolios. And um, once again, man, you know, guys, uh, please visit BrianChavis.com. You can sign up for um, a complimentary coaching call with Brian as well. Um, you know, if you're a listener of the podcast and you're you're um, you know reading Buy It, Rent It, Profit, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, so you can visit BrianChavis.com. And uh, just set up a time to just speak to him. We'd love to hear more about your goals, what you're looking to accomplish, and how we can help. Um, and, uh, you know, once again, Brian, anything else you want to want to share, man? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to share and drop some exciting news. Absolutely. I will be writing the next book in the Buy It, Rent It, Profit series. I love it, man. So, you know, I don't have a name yet, but you can bet Buy It, Rent It, Profit, the multifamily edition. So it's going to be everything about what you need to do to be a complete syndicator. Right, right. Understanding all five phases, not just acquisition, but implementation, stabilization, growth, and the exit strategy. How to master the art of asset management, how to master the art and the skills of property management, how to put together a syndication. Uh, It's going to go into great detail, but it's going to give, and there's other books that go into great detail. Right. But from a more of an investor's, perspective and you know focus on how to raise money build investor relationships we'll do that as well but we're going to go far more deeper into the actual operations because at the end of the day depending upon third-party management to get it from point a to point b we want individuals to be highly skilled in all five phases so this book is going to teach individuals how to become skillful in all five phases we're going to go into depth we're going to have Great templates in there, examples of private placement memorandums, examples of operating systems, examples, every example you need to be a successful real estate investor, entrepreneur, um, buy it, rent it, profit, multifamily edition is is, is going to have it. So I'm, I'm really excited. Just got Simon Schuster. Just you were yep. there th- this morning. Just got an email from Simon Schuster and uh, we are ready. Absolutely. We're ready to bring this, uh, bring this book out. It's going to also talk about. My personal uh, yep. challenges of when I uh, when I lost everything and and uh, was diagnosed with the brain tumor and you know what resi- what 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 did it take the resiliency um, what did I learn you yep. know faith wise what did I learn about being an entrepreneur and losing everything mm. and starting over from scratch literally physically losing everything and I'm not just talking finances right, but right. you know my speech and my my, my 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 mobility and even today you know battling with the constant weekly headaches right. Um, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you come back and how do you bounce back from that? You know, I want this book to share 
a little bit, you know, about that as well. And that's what's going to make this book even more different because it's going to talk about that personal experience and that journey. Um, and that, that was, that was probably the toughest journey, uh, experience that I've ever had. Wouldn't want to wish it on my enemy, yeah. but I really feel like, you know, things and principles and, and lessons that I've learned through that process, um, will help others. Absolutely. And, uh, at the end of the day, uh, if we do anything in our businesses, Nathan, whether it be Chavis Capital or BrianChavis.com, Chavis Academy, which, uh, you know, we're excited about coming out, uh, we know that we are uh, a service minded or we're, you know, that whatever we do, we want to be of service to people first. That is our product is be of service to others. You know, we are a, you know what I mean? We are a, um, you know, we're, we are a, a business that is focused on being of service to others and helping other individuals out. That's why we drop this free content as much as mm -hmm. we do. Um, you know, I think we probably drop more free content. I think we're the Gary V of, uh, <laughs> of, of real estate. I mean, I we, it, we, you know what I mean? We drop more, uh, and there's others out there who drop content, but I mean, as far as actually going in depth of yeah. what it's like to run these properties and, and day to day operations, from the property management and asset management aspect of what it's really like, Correct. you know, not just dancing around the acquisition and the purchase right. of right. it. Um, there's nobody that drops the kind of content we drop. And we do that because we know, you know, at the end of the day, man, that's, that's what this is all about is to be of service to others. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. Well, B, it's always a blessing to have you in the studio, man. I'm, I'm actually looking forward to uh, hearing more about your story. I, I, we, I know your story personally, but we're going to share that with you guys here soon you know, what we're doing right now is we're really just laying a foundation. Um, you know, as you're reading buy it, rent it profit, you're getting into the mind of the right. man who wrote the book, but, um, there is, uh, a, a doozy of a story behind all of this, man. And we're, we're looking forward to sharing that, but B once again, man, thank you so much for being in the studio, brother. And I look forward to speaking with you next week. See you next week. All right. Take care all right, brother. guys. Bye.